All right, welcome to our discussion of the land of Israel as a safe refuge. Uh, the Torah has a very interesting law, which um, you know puts us on an interesting side of, a, of the grand historical problem of slavery. Now, we know that a slavery is, a, is an awful thing. If, you, if you've studied up a little bit on what slavery actually entails, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to co- sugarcoat it. I mean, you take a human being, you put him on a block, you sell him, you, uh, you have to keep him, uh, keep him with you, you may, you may have to beat him up in order to keep him that way. So it's, it's not a pleasant kind of thing. And yet the Torah didn't cancel it. However, the Torah has done a tremendous job in trying to limit uh, slavery. If you ask, you know, why didn't the Torah cancel slavery? I think you look at the Civil War. I mean, just, just about 150 years ago, we tried to cancel slavery here in America. And it took the death of, of almost a million people to get that done. And even then, uh, many people have argued that basically slavery is still going on or that it uh, didn't really get canceled at that time. So for the Torah, you know, thousands of years ago to cancel slavery was not really uh, so possible, but they were able to limit it to a tremendous degree. And I believe that today's uh, law that we're going to look at is a wonderful example of how the Torah uh, showed its disdain for slavery and really did limit it uh, in, in a great way. So let's take a look. Um, Israel is a safe refuge. So the Torah says, Lotazgir Evel of Adunav. Against all the rules of the South, all the rules of, of, uh, of you know, the fugitive slave, you can't deliver a, a servant to his master who has escaped from his master to you. So if a slave runs away, you can't return him. Now, it sounds very general. Um, and of course, if it sounds general, it could be true in general that knows if anybody ran away, when he comes to you, you have to save him. And the rabbis limited it a little bit. I mean, that would be kind of a free-for-all. So maybe the Torah was really saying, look, if a slave could somehow escape this wretched uh, institution of slavery, terrific. Um, the rabbis kind of limited it a little bit to make it a little more practical in that time. Um, and that's how they understood it. Uh, but we'll see, we'll see in a minute. It also says, that once he does run away, he has to stay with you. Uh, you can't afflict him. So basically, he can't be a slave with you. You can, you can keep him, but not as a slave. You, you, um, so, uh, <clears throat> so first we had the Unculus. Unculus said, don't return a, a Gentile slave uh, to, uh, to him, but a Jewish slave be a different story. But why, why so? Why, why is it different for a Gentile slave? So we'll look at that later. Then uh, Rashi, who's also the classic commentator, he says, well, maybe we should follow the Targum, the, what we just read. And also another interpretation is even if the slave belongs to a Jew, but he ran, he ran away from outside of Israel and he came to Israel, let him free. And this the rabbis mention as well in the Gemara Gita in the Talmud. We proceed. Now let's look at the context. What was the previous verse? The previous verse was talking about a war. The name of this parsha, when you go out to war. So some of the rules of war, you have to make latrines, you can't, treat, you can't act like an animal when you're at war. And don't return the slave, because when you go to war, a lot of times there's, there are fugitives, there are traders, of, uh, there are turncoats from the other side who will come to you. Who would be the most logical turncoat? The slave. He doesn't really believe in the South, let's say, where he's living. He would rather come to the north and fight with them. So when you go to war, it could be that a slave will run away. He's not Jewish. Don't let him, uh, let, don't let him go back to his uh, captors. Uh, you keep him and let him become a regular citizen. That's the concept. Ramban says there's a practical advantage. He says, if you do this, it'll be great for you because you will learn, you, we will learn the passage to the city, the entrance to the city. Sometimes there's a city that has a siege. The doors are closed. But he knows that if you go in the back and you crawl underneath, you can get into the city. So he'll tell you how to do it. And um, a lot of times countries are conquered through slaves and other captives who run away. And so you can make use of them as well. So it's sort of a practical sort of an element as well. Then there's a question, isn't it stealing? I mean, as much as we loathe the idea of slavery, can't stand it. But fact is, someone bought the slave. So so he bought him, so, so you're stealing him. If he runs away to you, you're stealing him. That's why 
you know, in the South, you know, that was a big deal. If, if somebody ran away and you were hiding a slave, you know, you could get lynched or something for that. So, so why? Because they viewed this as robbery. So uh, it, it's, it's a grand robbery because uh, slaves were very expensive. Uh, so Rabbi Yosef Bechor says, you're not stealing. I'll tell you why. In, in Jewish law, the Gentile, one Gentile cannot own another Gentile. You can't buy somebody. A person can't buy anybody else. We'll see later. Why can a Jew own somebody? Maybe we'll see later. But, um, but a Gentile can't do that. So therefore, he doesn't really own him. So he says, you could buy from among their slaves, but they cannot buy each other. So the fact that he supposedly owns his slave, it doesn't work. The Rambam says, based on the Talmud, that there's actually, um, there is some monetary compensation here. He says it works like this. If the slave ran away from outside of Israel to Israel, you don't restore him to slavery. And it says you, don't, you shouldn't restore someone to slavery, to his master. But So what about the, the fact that he's technically a slave? He's owned by someone else. So you tell the, you tell the owner, write him a document of, of uh, freedom. And he writes it. And he says, but the slave owes me his price. So if he's worth 20 silver pieces, he owes me 20 silver pieces. Let him work a little bit, work it off, and pay me back. And if he didn't want to let him go, the court will declare he's ownerless, and uh, the, the slave can go free. So the, the, own, the owner has to let him go. So uh, there's no stealing because he does pay back for the fact that he was bought. So maybe a little strange to our modern sensibilities, but uh, that, that's how the Ramam solves the problem of, this, of, the, of the ownership uh, and the stealing. The real Sibukhor Shor says, we don't recognize ownership of a body, uh, by Gentiles at least, so forget about it. Shadal says, Ain gan geneva, there's no stealing over here. He lo naxi bo You see, if I, if, if I, the Jew, the Israelite, took him to be my slave, so you say, hey, you're stealing him. I bought him as a slave in uh, Syria, and now you're stealing him to, to have a, him as a slave in Jaffa. So he said, no, I'm not using him as a slave. I'm making him a free citizen. So there's no stealing going on here. I'm just taking someone into freedom. Now we get to our main question. What's the reason for this mitzvah to, uh, to not let the, the slave go back? Again, if the Torah cancels slavery altogether, okay, so it's consistent. If there's any slaves, you have to let them free. It's not quite true. Uh, the Torah said limited slavery. The Torah said if you hit him too hard and he loses a limb or an eye, then he goes free. So I guess you would be dis you have a disincentive to hit too hard to use a whip because what if he lost an eye or a limb or something? He has to go free. So the Torah limited the abuse of a slave. The Torah limits the sale of, of, of children. They used to sell their, people would sell their daughters. They had no money. They would sell their daughters, give them a way to get married. And um, they say that you can't abuse her. You have to, you have to marry her as a wife. Uh, if she doesn't want to, then she, she gets to go free. Um, we let the Jewish slaves go free after 50 years. Um, Jewish slaves are only slaves for six years or until the Jubilee years. And so there are a number of modifications of slavery. But if indeed there is slavery, then why do you have anybody who comes to you to run away, you, you, you let them free? What's going on? So one approach is it's about Israel. The Ibn Ezra says, he was an early Spanish commentary, you ba'lichvod Hashem, anikral Yisrael, it's for the honor of God, who is, is God is associated with Israel. Because everybody knows God gave us the Torah. If a Jew would retor, re, return the slave back to his master, he a chil Hashem. We desecration of God's name. If someone comes to Israel, Israel should treat them well. Now, from this perspective, it's very sad that you know we were not able to be more hospitable to the, Jew, the, um, the, the Gentiles who came from Sudan and other places who came to Israel a few years ago. Uh, we, we, there was a lot of beautiful things happened. A friend of mine was an ophthalmologist. He gave them free treatment. There were free clinics. Uh, they were making a living. They were, they were working in Tel Aviv. But it, 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 we did send them back. I don't know. It was, it was not, not a happy story. But it was a beautiful thing when we had them. It was the honor of Israel. And we sent them back. It's a little bit of a disgrace to the God of Israel. So it's about Israel. It's about the, the, the people of Israel. It's about... So he, actually, he doesn't use the word... Israel, he says, it's, it's the honor of the Jewish people. Reinu Bachi says, to show the beauty of the land of Israel. And um, why, why Israel? So here it relates to our next idea. The reason we want it 
to come back is because um, because it's about mitzvot. We want him to get more mitzvot. So so he says, well, if he comes if he comes to um, um, if he comes to Israel, he'll be able to keep more mitzvot. If let's say he was a a, a slave of a Jew, when someone becomes a slave of a Jew, he starts doing mitzvot. But if he's outside of Israel, he can't do the mitzvot of Israel. When he comes to Israel, he can do more mitzvot. He can do the tithing and the, the, the different types of tithing and uh, all, the, all the mitzvot related to Israel. And the base of Mikdash in those days, the temple. So he has more opportunities to do more, more mitzvot. So why would I return him to the outside of Israel? There are more mitzvot in Israel. So it's about mitzvot. Shadal said, no, it's about mercy. There's midas harachmi. What you have here is mercy. It's a story simply of having mercy on a runaway slave. Because we know the terrible situation, status of slaves in the olden days and really during any days. Rav Simpson Fal Hirsch has a whole theory about, about this. And of course, you have to remember that Rav Simpson Fal Hirsch is living in the 19th century, He's living around the time of the Civil War. He's reading about the Civil War in America. Um, of course, most European countries it's more or less let their slaves go free, except they had some colonies, I think. And uh, so a lot of people are thinking about the issue of slavery. And he's also been granted equal rights. Jews have been granted equal rights, and he's thinking a lot about equal rights. He's also thinking about um, the, the, the Jewish love for all of humanity, because he's not just, uh, he's living in Germany. He's professing that he's a humanist, that he uh, believes in the rights of, of everyone. So let's see what he says. He says the status, status of the slave in the Jewish home and in the Jewish nation is, is that the slave turns into a member of the Jewish society and takes on the high morals and the obligation of keeping the mitzvot because a slave takes on some of the commandments. Just, he only is exempt from a few commandments. And according to the rules of the Torah in Israel, um, they would treat the slave humanely. That's what his claim is, is that all the laws of slavery landed out treating him very humanely. And we are, we are aware of the great difference between how we traded him we, tra- we treated him and other people in the world. So even a slave of a Jew who lives outside Israel, maybe he's treating him like they do in the South. Maybe he's treating him like they do outside of Israel. So we have to let him go. Uh, according to what we say, it, the, all these mitzvot are here to, to, to make progress in the moral realm. Um, and it's here to promote the approach of humanism toward all people, even the Gentile and even the slave. Uh, and these, these fundamentals are what, what uh, jump out at us here in these verses. Rav Hirsch has a more general uh, philosophy of Jewish slavery. Because when, when, when Avraham refers to his slaves, the Torah refers to it as his students, chanichav. People, he's mechanech. He inaugurates. He initiates. He he educates. Um, he says these are they're really his slaves, but he calls them his edu- his educatees, his students, because it's telling us that the nature of slavery, so-called slavery, for the nation of Avram, it was a way of saving souls from the uh, despicable ways of the pagans, and um, and they're, they're, um, and, and to bring them close to the, uh, the truth of Abraham. And slaves who were bought by a Jew become Jewish. So um, now this principle has been abused, right? I'm sure the Southern preachers uh, would, would have said that they're trying to save these pagan slaves who came from Africa uh, from their paganism. Again, I don't know that every African was a pagan, but let's say some of them were, or would not, their, their religion wouldn't necessarily qualify under Christianity or perhaps under Judaism as monotheism. So we're trying to save them from these philosophies and we're bringing them to Christianity or whatever it is. So you could abuse this and then you can just do whatever you want with them. Uh, I think in the end, if you bring them to your religion and then it turns out that your religion is an abusive religion, you know, I'm not sure you've really advanced the cause of humanity. But if indeed they become like your students, uh, then it's different, a different matter. In the Talmud, you have a few, a few um, slaves that are mentioned of different rabbis and those slaves uh, were very beloved. For instance, the slave of of Rebbe, Rebbe Yudah Nasi, who wrote the Mishnah, uh, his slaves were, um, uh, she, she was so beloved, 
when everyone was praying that the rabbi should live when he was getting very sick, she, she, she stopped them and, told, and, and decided that he should die because he was suffering great humility, uh, humiliation. Um, the, uh, the slave of Rabbi Gamliel, was, uh, he was very learned and he, he knew all the laws of the sukkah and all the different things. Um, the, uh, the slave of Rav Nachman uh, used to make a living at night. He, would, he was an entertainer. He would entertain people at night. So he was kind of a joker. He made, he made his own living on the side. So um, uh, these are relationships that seem uh, more benign. But again, you know, isn't there a coercive element uh, to these things? Uh, didn't they have to beat them up in order to, to keep them there? Um, so I don't, I don't know. And that's why, you know, we don't have slavery anymore. Uh, but, um, but it's certainly a different concept. There are a lot of moral responsibilities toward the slave in this Jewish conception. It's, it's, it's the evolution of, of ethics. The Torah is trying to push the world away from slavery and into the idea of students that you could help advance people. If someone is falling into slavery, <clears throat> you can get them and bring them to a better place. But of course, at that point, Lotan, you can't afflict them either. Rav Hirsch also says that a, a person um, can only take a slave uh, if he was already a slave. In other words, he, he claims that a Jew cannot make a slave. You can't acquire someone from the nations and then make him into a slave. Um, <clears throat> When, when a Jew bought a slave from the Gentiles, he was saving him from the institution of slavery. Um, and um, the, he, he now alludes to the civil war in America, even though he's living in Germany. He says the, the, the things that are going on, very sad things that are going on during our times. Um, there was also a, uh, apparently a, a rebellion of the slaves in, in Jamaica in, in 1825. Uh, 18... 35, was it? I think, uh, 65. 65. So it shows uh, how uh, difficult the situation of, of, of the slave is, uh, whether, uh, the, whether they have no rights, or even if they have supposed rights, but nobody gives them any rights, um, it's still a horrible situation. Okay. But the Jewish home, says Rav Hirsch, was a, was a refuge uh, for the slave. He's protected. He can join the people of Hashem. If you didn't give him a bris, you can't eat the Paschal offering. A Jew is not really a Jew. If his serf, slave, slaves are not treated as Jews, they weren't given a bris, they weren't doing the mitzvot, then you, the master, you can't eat the Paschal lamb either. You can't partake of the Jewish community. You don't belong because you have slaves who are just slaves. They have to become Jewish. You have to help them move forward. If they're not at least moving forward in their, in their moral life, then why do you have a slave altogether? So that's interesting. And then the Torah says, don't afflict him. So the idea that we said, we started with Shadal, that it's all about not to return, is reflected also in the, the following verse, which says, don't afflict him. Even after he comes into, and he becomes Jewish, he lives among you, don't afflict him. Who lists all 613 bits for He says, look, just like God added the prohibition of affliction of a stranger, since he's strange in the nation, so too he added the command for the slave, for he's even weaker and more degraded than the stranger. For you cannot say this is a slave, and therefore there's no sin to afflict him. You see, you're not allowed to afflict anyone. You can't verbally afflict someone, right? Uh, you can't say, oh, that's a beautiful vase. How much do you want for that? So a hundred dollars. Oh, thanks very much. And then you go to the you go to the catalog and you buy it for seventy five dollars because you, you got him going. He thought you were going to buy it, and then you walk out of the store. Um, so you can't afflict people on purpose. You can't use verbal affliction. So if you can't afflict people with words, so of course you can't afflict the the, the stranger who converts, the, the 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 runaway slave, the fugitive who converts. Because of course you can't afflict him. And of course, you can't afflict the stranger among you. And yet the Torah says, don't afflict the stranger. Don't afflict this runaway slave. Why do you need to say that? You already know that. The answer is that since people would think that, who cares? He's already so degraded. What difference does it make if I beat him up a little bit more? And the answer is no. You can't even verbally berate him because he has human worth and value. The Sefer Abatim was a wonderful book 
written by Rabbi David Akulchavi, and my sons are, have, have educated me about him. And it says, some would not care about his affliction, thinking he will not be embarrassed anyway, because he's used to his lowliness. And the Torah says, no, forget about that. Because no one is used to his lowliness. You can't treat anyone a lowly, as a lowly person. The Ramam Light writes that you cannot afflict him, even with words, because if you do, you violate three violations. You're, violate, you're afflicting the stranger, you're afflicting a Jew, and you're afflicting a runaway slave. Um, and um, why? Because, particularly because he, he has the lowliest spirit. He's the lowest person on the totem pole. He's not only a stranger, he's not, he wasn't born Jew, but also he was a slave. He has the lowest status. You have to be extra careful not to afflict him. He's particularly sensitive. Rabbi Yosef B'choshor says, um, don't give him in, even though somebody bought him. But it's not right because you're taking him away from mitzvot. He didn't, he didn't have mitzvot when he was with the non-Jew. Now he has mitzvot. And the rabbis say, even if he was among Jew, the Jews, you should give him back. You shouldn't give him back because if he was outside of Israel, it's better for him to be in Israel. There are more mitzvot in Israel. And this is an open rebuke to all of us who live outside of Israel that we have less mitzvot and we should try to get to Israel one day where we have more mitzvot. There, uh, Ibn Bilam was a, a, a obscure commentary from Spain, 11th century. He was obscure because he wrote his commentary in Judeo-Arabic, but it's okay. Uh, we have his translation today. And he says, You only have to keep the slave if he wants to be Jewish. If the slave doesn't want to be Jewish, you can send him back. Who cares? The Ramban says, the reason for this mitzvah is that with us, he's going to worship God. And it's not right. We should send him back to idolatry. So he's also of the opinion that it has to do with bringing him back to the Jewish faith. It has to do with, as the Targum Yonatan says, that he's he, to take him away from the idolatry and to bring him under the wings of heaven. The Sefer Abati of, of, of Rabbi David Akuchavi says the, that in Loratza, if he didn't want to, uh, he says, this is all part of the holiness, the greatness of the Torah, uh, to help anybody who tries to come under the divine opinion if he wants to be a Jew. The Ralbag is a medieval uh, uh, Provencal commentator, and he says, it shows the love of the land of Israel, because even the Jewish slave, slave of the Jew, who runs o- over there to Israel, he's saved in Israel. We should not send him back. And he should become a, a righteous convert. And the Torah wanted him to stay with us and, uh, and he wanted him to be part of the mitzvot. Um, and, um, but if he wanted to go back to his idolatry, then we send him back. He's not going to improve anyway, so then he, he, he has to go back. Uh, the Sefer Achinuch says that the root of this mitzvah is for the honor of the land of Israel, that anyone who runs there should be saved from slavery so that we should think of how honored the place of Israel is, and we should put in our hearts to fear God in that place. And this will all help our nation, because God wants mercy and love, kindness. So it's about the land of Israel, it's also about mercy. So, why don't you send him back? Number one, you want to save his soul. You want him to come under the divine wings, to have all the mitzvot of the Torah, to have more mitzvot than he had outside of Israel. Number two, we have mercy on him. We have, it's a, Torah is a merciful book and being a slave is a miserable condition. And number three, it's all about Israel because Israel should be a country of refuge. Israel should, should be a model for all countries that in Israel, God is a God of mercy and God wants the best for everyone and it should be for the honor of Israel that it's a place of refuge. People know that, that it's like a safe city. It's a safe country. You come to Israel, you're free. And, um, you know, I hope that one day Israel will have the luxury of being that type of country where anybody who is a refugee from anywhere else in the world should be able to come like America has sometimes been able to do, to say, you know, give me your the wretched and your poor, that, as it says on the uh, Statue of Liberty, written by Emma Lazarus, the Jewish poetess, uh, uh, that uh, we, we should be a place of refuge. That's an honor to a country. It's an honor to the United States. that We've often been a place of refuge for all. And we hope that Israel one day can also be that type of, of, of refuge for all those who seek refuge, all those who come want to live a more moral and, and more uplifted life. And that's part of what Israel is all about, part of what Judaism is all about, to uplift 
and to care about all of humanity. So at this time, uh, we conclude our lecture, and this time I open up to questions for others. Yes. So the slave, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. So this, we, you know, the slave, the good part about having the slave is that he could keep the, the uh, mitzvot, but he couldn't keep Shabbos because he's not truly Jewish. So he couldn't keep all of them. Couldn't, couldn't keep Shabbos. Because he's not Jewish. Where? In Israel or outside Israel? Any of them. No, no, no. When a Jew owns a slave, then um, he, be, uh, in, the, in the olden days, then he became Jewish in all ways, except he's not, he's exempt from mitzvot, strangely enough, in the same mitzvot that women are exempt from. So he doesn't have to sit in the sukkah, lulav, shofar, tefillin, talis. That he doesn't do. Everything else he does. So Shabbos, absolutely. Goodbye. Now, Goodbye. there is a big... Sorry? Sorry. Go ahead. There is a debate as to whether, well, let's say he says, I just want to leave idolatry. I forgot to mention this. Ramban, Bishor mentioned, if he just wants to leave idolatry, he says, look, I'm not, I don't want to be Jewish. I'm going to keep Shabbos. I'm going to come to Israel. I don't want to worship idols anymore. So we say, fine, join us. You'll live here. It's called the Gerto Shav, a, a resident alien. You'll live here and uh, uh, you don't have to, um, uh, you don't have to keep all the laws. Some people say that such a person should also keep Shabbos because it's out of, out of keeping with, you know, he's going to be driving his car around in all these religious neighborhoods, it's not right. So some say that includes Shabbos. Some say it uh, includes everything except he, he's hungry. He likes to eat uh, shrimp, you know, so he can eat whatever he wants, but every otherwise he's Jewish. So there are all these different statuses. But yes, if someone is, is merely a slave of a Jew, they have to have a bris, and then they are obligated in all the mitzvot except for a few things that women don't do, you know, just minor, minor uh, occasion, mitzvot that come up occasionally in these lives. Um, so uh, a slave is uh, very much obligated in the commandments. Does that answer your question? Did I miss something? No, I think that's it.